What did you dream about last night? Can you remember? Either way, we'll all have dreams that stay with us forever. People say that they're just dreams or that they're just pretend, but then the way they make us feel is real, though hard to comprehend. Dreams have been a mystery since time was first recorded. At every stage in history, dreams have been reported. Now everyone defines a dream in different ways, but I believe that if we still have dreams today, they must be important. Dreams are what inspire us. Dreams are what we strive for. Even if for nothing else, dreams are what we fight for. They feed the life inside of us. They're what we stay alive for. And more, some dreams can mean so much. They're ones that we would die for. Horize or horizons. They were both in love and nothing could divide them. It was the type of love they write about. The type of love that time will crown. A love that most will never find. A love that most would die without. She was the life in his heartbeat, the light when he can't see, the brightest star in the sky and on these dark streets, his beginning, his now and every future breath. She was the universe and every light the moon reflects. She was the moon and sun in human form that you could touch, the embodiment of dreams. She was proof of love. She was hope. She was home in whatever setting. Heaven was together in whatever land they'd step in. She had the strength to love the people who were never taught its name. She stood beside the masses when they dared to call for change. She flamed the love inside his heart when all around was rain. But life was soon to change, and it would never be the same. For 30 years, the people of Sudan had suffered violence under a man named Omar al-Bashir. Bashir was the clear definition of a tyrant who only held power using firearms and fear. In the early 2000s, he oversaw war crimes. Most of you have heard about the war in Darfur. That's West Sudan, but it wasn't really war. It's not a war when only one side are using armed force. What it was is genocide. That's what happened. More blood and murder than the people could have fathomed. The death count was said to be around half a million civilians who were raped and murdered by his militants, a group called the Janjaweed. Now, 15 years later, and Bashir was still not backing up. Plus, food and fuel subsidies received a massive cut. The people tried to rise before, but this time they had enough. They organized peacefully. We saw the masses gather up. They faced violence, but responded with peace. They didn't fight with weapons. They organized a sit-in. More than a million people just sat in the streets. Men, children, elders, women. There was a massacre at dawn. They were attacked while they were sleeping. 500 dead at least because they asked for freedom. Children killed, women bleeding, beatings, rape, murder, screaming. What if she was murdered next? He couldn't stand the thought of it. Samir couldn't bear to think of Ahlam being torn from him. They were just engaged and they had planned to start a family. How would they build a future in a place so full of tragedy? Sudan was never safe, but they had stayed because they called it home. Now it seemed they had to leave or die, so they were forced to go to Italy. It was a country in Europe that was safe for them to start a life. The journey would be dangerous and a safe route was hard to find. He'd have to make the trip alone at first and that destroyed him. But once he arrives and claims asylum, she could go and join him. That was the plan. Ahlam, I can't leave you. Samir. I can't leave you. Samir. نحن شفنا الحصل اللي عبده والباقيين يتخارجوا وبيجوا زوجاتهم ارامل Translation أحلام I don't think I can do this Samir I won't leave you Samir We saw what happened to Abdul and the others They were forced to leave and their wives became widows Please Habibi Maybe we should stay We will be killed here Samir I'll be dead without you أحلام Take this A doll's hat? I had a dream last night. We were together in Europe. We had a child. I was holding her. You were holding us. It was peaceful. No gunshots, no screams. Just us. Our little family. With everything to live for. A whole future ahead of us. A future that is harder than it's ever been. To imagine here. It's a child's hut. In one year from now, we'll be in Italy. It will be winter time. I hear it snows there during winter. Our child, we need a hat. 
<laughs> Habibti, you can't be. You're no, not. No, not pregnant. I don't carry our child, but I do carry the dream of our child. And one day, in the not too distant future, when it's our time, that dream will become real, and this hat will rest on our child's head. Promise me, Samir. Promise me. I promise. I swear to you, nothing in this world will keep us apart. I'll carry the hat, just like I carry our dreams, for however long it takes, until I'm with you again. There will be no distance too far, no time too long, no border too high, and no power too strong to keep my arms from yours. The oceans separate lands, not souls, and I'll swim every sea, climb every mountain, dream with you, of you, and because of you. I'll belong to you until the last leaf falls and the final sun sets, until the final wind blows and time itself ceases. We will be together again. I swear it. I swear it. The lovers found a smuggler, aka an agent. They explained their plan. The man explained they'd have to pay him. He said that it was dangerous, that Samir might not make it. But they couldn't stay, and so they paid the man to take him. The journey was tricky and wouldn't be linear. It was impossible, could it be riskier? Started at Ombudsman Market and put on a truck to the border of Libya. Moving through Libya till they could smell there was sea. They were put on a boat and alone with the sea. They prayed they would make it, and they did make it before they were seen by the coastal police. There wasn't a chase. They went straight to the station. They were degraded and beaten and their fingerprints were taken. Then they were freed. They were released. They went there to stay, but they told them to leave. They couldn't believe it. They decided to journey the mountains to France. They were still in a group and they found there were paths. They traveled with pace. Their bodies would ache, but if they were to make it, they had to be fast. France. It wasn't where he planned to go, but life had seemed to force him. As long as he could be with her, that's all that was important. He didn't care where it was, and so he kept on walking. Then, along the way, he overheard the others talking. They said that once they got to France, they didn't plan to stay, that they would claim asylum when they got to the UK. It's where they felt was safest. They invited him to go with them, and so it was decided he would take a final boat with them. They made it to the UK. They were met by sirens. Then began their journey through the violence of asylum. The purpose of this interview is to find out more about you, to understand your reasons for being here in the UK, and to collect information relating to your asylum claim. The interview is being recorded and I will be taking notes. Do you understand? Yes. Please confirm again for the record that you do not wish for a translator to be present. I don't need one, thank you. What is your full name? Samir Suleiman. Spell it, please. It's S-A-M-E-R-S-U-L-I-M-A-N. How old are you, Samir? I'm 27 years old. Date of birth? 1st of March, 1993. What is your country of origin? I came from Sudan. Sudan. Okay. Sexuality? I have a fiancé. Her name is Alam. She's... Okay, Sama. Why did you choose to leave Sudan? I had to. We weren't safe there. Have you heard of the Janjaweed? They're killing people. They've killed thousands of us. We didn't want to leave, but we weren't safe. Who is we? Me and my fiancé. You travelled here with your fiancé? No, she stayed in Sudan, but she... Who did you travel with? I don't know who they are. How many people did you travel with, Summer? There were six of us. And when did you leave Sudan? It was July 27th. This year? Yes. And how did you travel? Which countries did you travel through? That will be a long answer. Good. Then you'd better get started. The interview lasted three hours. He asked a million questions. Big questions, long questions, quick questions, slick questions, small questions, all questions, trick questions. The officer repeated them like it was an obsession. He just kept on firing. He used them as a weapon. He wasn't trying to understand. He wanted a confession. 
In the end, they took Samir and put him in detention. Scene change. Key change. Locked in a policed cage. It was like a prison, but there wasn't a release date. Hundreds of men locked up without a charge. Two months passed, and Samir could feel his dreams fade. Suddenly, they could hear a banging at the fences. One of the other men there explained they were protesters, that they were there to show support to people in detention. Many of them in the past had even been arrested. The man told Samir about one specific group he'd seen, the Stansted 15. He'd seen them on the news this week. Samir was intrigued to learn more about the rumours, and the centre had a library with one or two computers. Stansted 15. You might have heard the story. 15 people at an airport. They drove up and cut through the fence that surrounds it. Activists there to stop a plane becoming airborne. They were scared, but they were prepared. No time for doubting. They knew what they had to do. It's what they were there for. They approached the plane, then they locked themselves around it. 10 hours later, they were still there at the airport. They all got arrested, but the plane stayed grounded. Now, you might be wondering why all the drama? Well, this specific flight was something called a charter. It was a deportation flight with 60 people on board, all being deported to Nigeria and Ghana. People who were vulnerable, people seeking amnesty, people fleeing war, global warming and catastrophe, people facing persecution, misery and death. And yes, some of them were foreigners, but people nonetheless. And lots of them are documents. Not all of them were foreigners. 11 of those 60 had every right to stay. It's just a fact. At least 11 had documents. I know because to this very day, they live in the UK. Which is great. But the 15 were all charged of aggravated trespass, criminal damage in an airport bylaw. And after four months, they learned the Attorney General has said that it's terrorism they'll be facing time for. They were charged under Section 1 of the Aviation and Maritime Security Act 1990. A terror charge. They went from trespass to a terror charge. Three months in jail versus life behind metal bars. You want to know what terror is? Want to find the terrorists? Go to the home office. That's where terror lives. Kidnapping people, putting them in vans, separating families, putting them in camps. That's terror. Beating them behind the bars we built for our security, like Jimmy Morbenga killed by G4S security. That's terror. Keeping people locked up for long amounts of time, when being born somewhere else is their only crime. The violence of the hostile environment, the lies, the charter flights, sending people somewhere else to die. Please forgive me if I'm wrong, but I don't think I've made an error. By any common person's definition, that is terror. Do you have a cough? Do you blink more than five times a day? Before you go to sleep, do you sometimes just lie awake? Do you feel your heartbeat? Ever bang your toe? Do you lose your car keys? Do you have a nose? The Rhyming Guide to Lucid Dreaming. What did you dream about last night? Can you remember? Either way, we'll all have dreams that stay with us forever. People say that they're just dreams or that they just pretend, but then the way they make us feel is real, though hard to comprehend. Dreams have been a mystery since time was first recorded. At every stage in history, dreams have been reported. Now everyone defines a dream in different ways, but I believe that if we still have dreams today, they must be important. Dreams are what inspire us. Dreams are what we strive for. Even if for nothing else, dreams are what we fight for. They feed the life inside of us. They're what we stay alive for. And more, some dreams can mean so much. They're ones that we would die for. But bit by bit, the world persuaded you that dreams are not for real. And over time, they made you buy the lie and claimed you got a deal. But you feel trapped and powerless. And nothing works the problems out. You're trying to find a way to get away, but there's no options now. Your boss has got a hold on you. They're ripping out the soul in you, but you've got bills and you can feel the pressure. It's controlling you. You want to escape. You need a change. You wish the end would come. It's like you're in a cage. You think of ways to leave, but there are none. You're out of control. If I gave you a control and said that you could change your settings, that you could live your life without their influence or edits, that there's another life to live. It's just that you've been blind to it, but everything you dream about, you could have in seconds. What would you do if I told you that you could live a dream? Forget poetic metaphors, I mean live in a dream. That you could go to sleep, but then awaken in the dream. That you'd be there and you could take control inside the dream. You'd be self-conscious. 
You control everything. You could go anywhere. You could do anything. You could be with anyone. Do everything you dreamed before. But everything you'd feel would be as real as this, or even more. What would you do if you knew now that everything I've said is true? The scientists have proven it, and you could learn to do it too. Would you want to know how? What I'm describing here is known as lucid dreaming. Some people do it naturally, so you might know the feeling. Basically, it's becoming conscious when you're sleeping. It's waking up inside a dream to realise that you're dreaming. They say on average people dream two hours every night, which means we dream for six years across our entire lives. So if you could learn to do this and you became lucid, in theory, you could get an extra six years of self-conscious life in your dreams. Now, believe me when I say I know it's more than just appealing, that you could live in other worlds is more than just intriguing. But if you want to learn yourself how to live in other realms, first you've got to understand a bit about what sleep is. So there are five stages of sleep. Stages one and two are known as light stage sleep. This is where our memories are formed in largest parts. Stages three and four are called deep sleep or slow wave. This is like a growth stage and heals our body fast. Stage five is what's known as REM most commonly. This is when your brain and respiration rate are on a peak. It happens every 90 minutes or at least likely near it. This is where the dreaming happens. This is where you want to be. Now hold that thought or quickly grab a pen and paper. We'll come back to REM again a little later. Okay, so there's not a right way to become lucid. You don't need to study it because anyone can do it. But there is a type of blueprint and I myself have used it. So I thought I'd break it down so you can listen through it. The first thing you can do is start to document the dreams you have. Keep a pad beside your bed and every morning reach for that. Write whatever you remember. Then in time you'll read them back and notice patterns in your dreams. And it's the patterns we can hack. You'll see that there are certain things you dream about the most at night. You'll notice there's repeats of certain themes or people over time. And so when you encounter them again, you'll pause proceedings, you'll stop to see the pattern, then you'll question if you're dreaming. At this stage, you need to do a test to check reality. You suspect you're dreaming, but you're not sure if you're actually. So you do a physical test, and it could be a simple check, but this will tell you whether or not you're dreaming and quite factually. For example, you could look at your hand, count your fingers, do you have the right amount? Jump in the air. Do you float around or simply come back down? Close your mouth and hold your nose. See if you're still breathing. These are some of the many tests to check whether you're dreaming. The more you do these checks, the more lucidity is probable. So try to check reality in every way that's possible. Any time awake or sleeping, any night or day you're dreaming, learn to do this naturally and soon you'll be unstoppable. Now, there are a few things left for me to mention. Little tips that I would like to bring to your attention. These will help you lucid dream. They prove to be of use to me. The first of which is something called setting an intention. The principle is simple. Create a plan within yourself. You tell your inner consciousness that you will go to other worlds. You repeat a phrase that says, tonight I'm going to lucid dream. You visualize the dream itself and delve towards it as you sleep. It really works. Now, the final tip to share with you feels almost like we're cheating, but it's perhaps the most successful hack to lucid dreaming. It's called waking back to bed. And in my view, this hack's the best. If you like, I'll break it down. I find it quite intriguing. First of all, before you go to bed, you set a phone alarm. Set it to ring in six hours time. Then when you're woken up, stay awake for 20 minutes, setting your intentions, then go back to sleep and enter REM in seconds. Now, I know that some of this might not be making total sense. That's to be expected. You might need to take some slower steps. I don't pretend that some of you won't try at first of no success, but when you do get used to it, you'll thank yourself with no regrets. Because once you're lucid, there's excitement. Like intense, immense excitement. Careful though, you'll wake up straight away if you get too excited. Take a breath and take your time. Control the dream or pay the price. For help with this, search online for tips on stabilizing. Once you get the hang of it, you can use lucid dreaming to create whole places. You can fly, you can time travel through the ages, teleport, walk through walls, you can even shapeshift. And yes, you could also see your secret crush naked. But beyond the standard things that people love to do when lucid, many around the world have found a wealth of different uses. People use lucid dreaming to practice and develop skills, ones they need or ones they choose. Build auras, heal traumas, both in mind and body too. To speak to their subconscious selves, to travel past the path of pain, to see and speak to ones they love, 
even if they've passed away. To conjure up ideas of which could change the world or change their own. To build the greatest works of art, beauty that you've never known. From Dali to Da Vinci, many artists are in dreams. Even I wrote sections of this guide while I was fast asleep. There's a thousand uses we could find for being lucid. But we're told the dreams are not for real or that they're stupid. Because they don't want a world that's ours. They just want us working hard. They won't let us dream. They want us living their illusion. That's why dreaming is a radical act. Dreaming is resistance. To dream is to imagine that the world could be so different. Imagination soon becomes a move towards a vision and a vision we can work towards to change our whole position. So never let them tell you not to dream or what to dream of. Go to sleep, live your dreams, then wake up and dream on. Samir couldn't believe it. But what if it was true? What if it was real and he could learn to do it too? What if there is another world, but he just never knew? What if he could meet her there and they could do it soon? What if it was possible? He knew it wasn't probable, but it was worth a try, he thought. There's nothing he could lose. He was desperate just to see her, so he could hold her near. So he thought he'd do some research and found that there was proof. There was proof? That was it. He decided he would try it. He'd meet her in his dreams and they could be there, reunited. He was excited. He didn't get it straight away. It was really hard for him. But practice was a part of it. He didn't have the heart to quit. He read about it every day and every night advanced in it. Some weeks passed and finally it seems that he had mastered it. And that same day he received some news he couldn't quite believe. He was granted bail. He was going to be released. He would have to go to meetings every second week. But even if it's just for now, he was out and free. Ya Rohi. Samir, is it you? Yes, Habibti, it's me. You are calling from a different number. This is my new phone. I'm out. What do you mean? They released me from the center. Are you serious? Listen. <sighs> Samir, you are free. It's okay, it's okay, Habibti. Habibi, you are free. What is happening? They have given you asylum. Well, not yet. Oh. But I'm out now. They put me on bail. Okay. So what does that mean? I don't know exactly. My caseworker said they're still processing my claim. That they're releasing me until they come to a decision about whether I can stay. Until then, I just have to go back and meet them every two weeks. So why did they release you? You'd prefer me in there? Samir. I have no idea. Judging by the way they treated us in the center, I didn't get the feeling it's because they care about my well-being. Maybe it cost them less money to put me in a hostel than keep me in the center. Are you in a hostel now? You don't sound very happy that you are out. The others are still there, locked up. Good people. People. Treated like animals. The guards beat them. And they were hurting themselves too. Cutting their wrists. Jumping from stairs. None of them know when they're going to be released or if they'll be released at all. Many of them will be sent back to the same places they were trying to escape. Sent back to be tortured. Or killed. It's horrific. But what can you do for them, Habibi? Nothing now, but I will. One day, I'll go back for them. Inshallah. I believe you will. What is the hostel like? It's just a room, but it's not too cold. Okay, and how are you eating? You don't have any money. The government here gives me a bit of money. I collect it from the post office. 40 pounds a week. I know it sounds like a lot, but things are so expensive here. And I can't earn more money because they won't let me work until I get permission to stay. Oh. I might not be in prison anymore, but I'm still stuck here. Trapped. For now. Did your caseworker say how long it will be until the decision? He said he doesn't know. He doesn't tell me anything. None of them do. But we don't have to wait for them anymore. Why? 
What do you mean? When I was in prison, in the center, I discovered something. It's something that's going to change our lives. A way for us to be together, not in months or years, but now. What are you talking about, Samir? It's called lucid dreaming. Habibi, have you started drinking? Listen, I'm serious. There's something called lucid dreaming. Have you heard of it? Never. What is it? I want you to watch a video. This phone doesn't have internet, so I can't send you a link to it. But if you go onto YouTube and type Potent Whisper, the rhyming guide to lucid dreaming. Habibi, are you sure you're okay? Ahlam, please, just go onto YouTube and type Potent Whisper, the rhyming guide to lucid dreaming. Then give me a call back as soon as you've watched it. Okay? Okay. Okay, I love you. Speak soon. Okay, bye. I love you. Ahlam? Okay, I watched the video. So what did you think? It was a bit long. Ahlam, what did you think about what he said? About lucid dreaming? Yes, it's all true. I've been doing that for years. You know how to lucid dream? If that is what they call it, then yes. It doesn't happen all the time. Perhaps once or twice a week. So why, why, why did you never tell me? I thought everybody did it. Anyway, it's not real. What do you mean? The dreams. They are just dreams. It's not real life, is it? What makes you say that? Well, because this is real life. And how do you know? Because you are here, Samir. And your love is the most real thing I have ever known. So do you only love me here? What do you mean? Well, does your love for me just disappear when you're dreaming? Well, no. But most of the time, I don't know I'm dreaming. When you're lucid? What about when you're lucid? Well, uh, I mean, yeah. I, I still love you. But you are not there, Samir. You are here. So I've been asking myself, why can't I be there? What's stopping the two of us from being there together in your dream? Think about it. When you become lucid, you become self-conscious, which means that you, your consciousness, is there. That becomes your actual reality for that period of time. So if I were to become lucid too, whilst you were lucid, could we not both be there together? I don't know. I have never thought about it before. I've thought about nothing else for the past month. And I think it will work. I mean, when you describe it like that, it makes sense. Maybe it is possible, but how would it work? First, we would both need to become lucid. You said you only become lucid once a week? Yeah, it happens randomly. I'm not in control of it, and I usually wake up shortly after I become lucid. I get excited and try to fly. Then I wake up. I was the same at first, but I found some tips online, and they actually help. Tips for what? Becoming lucid or staying lucid? Both. When it comes to becoming lucid, it usually starts with what they call a trigger. A trigger is something that happens, or something that you notice, which makes you question whether or not you're dreaming. It could be anything, just something unusual. At that stage, you do a reality check, just like the man said in the video to check whether you're awake or dreaming. One way to check, that really works well for me, which he didn't mention, is the light switch test. Okay. It's strange, but for a lot of people, the light switches don't seem to work in their dreams. It's the same for me too. They just don't work. The lighting never changes in the dream. So if I want to check whether I'm dreaming, I find the light switch, turn it on, and if it doesn't work, then I know I'm in a dream and I become lucid. Okay, so once I do become lucid, then what? Well, we would go to sleep tonight. At the same time, we dream, we become lucid. Then we would have to both meet somewhere. By the river. I will meet you by the river, where we fairies met. By the river, tonight. If we can't be together here... We will be together there. For now. I love you so much, Samir. I love you too, Habibti. 
Ahlam woke up and stepped out of bed. She let out a deep yawn and bent down to stretch. She noticed it was dark. It was usually much brighter. She went to turn the light on, but it didn't light up. She realized she was dreaming. She was lucid and aware. She jumped through a window and flew into the air, whizzing around, skipping on clouds. No part of her was scared. She went with speed towards their meeting place and saw that he was there. He looked at her. She took his hand. They turned to light. The two had merged. They traveled every planet through the galaxies and universe, gliding, sliding, flying, laughing, smiling, smiling twirling, 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 dancing. It was incredible. It was out of this world. Samir, hello? Are you still there? It wasn't me. What? I can't believe it. What are you talking about? It wasn't me. I wasn't there with you. Well, where were you? I was with you, swimming in the Indian Ocean. What do you mean? Samir, I'm confused now. While you were dreaming of us in the stars, I was dreaming of us in the ocean. Which means that we weren't sharing the same dream. They were separate dream spaces. We weren't really together in the same place. We were just dreaming of each other at the same time. But it was so real. Because you were lucid. But you were there. It wasn't me, Ahlam. They were separate dreams. You were in yours, and I was in mine. Okay, so how do we share the same dream? There must be a way to do that. To be in the same place, at the same time. It's called dream sharing. I've read articles about it. I've heard stories about it. But they're just stories. Okay, but... I feel so stupid. Samir, you said other people have done it. But it hasn't been proven. Lucid dreaming is real. We know it is. And there's scientific proof. Shared dreaming is different. There's no proof that it works. It's just... Samir, how did they say they do it? I'll look for the articles and I'll call you back. Okay. They read every article to learn. They tried a thousand ways. They were close to giving up. Then one night, they found a way. They did it. They were both so happy that they could have cried. How they did it? I don't know. Your guess would be as good as mine. But they were together now. And life was like heaven now. They travelled through the ages to the places they had read about. No walls or limitations. No borders. No nations. For the first time in life, they were tasting freedom's flavours. They flew straight to Angel Falls, the world's tallest waterfall. Then the Antelope Canyon. The Azores in Portugal. They walked across the beauty of the Sala de Uyuni. They ran hand in hand up Japan's Mount Fuji. They danced in Disco Bay, skipped across the cliffs of Dover. He carved the poems in the rock and stone of Cappadocia. They roamed the floating mountains out in China's Zhangjiajie. Wherever they were, if they were together, they were happy there. They finished the night sat upon a full moon, contently. He held Ahlam in his arms and whispered to her gently. Habibti, hold out your hand. The other one. A ring. Samir, it's... I got it from Saturn. <sighs> of all the places that we've traveled, in every continent on Earth and every planet in the universe, the space inside your heart is the only place I want to be. You melt my heart. In your arms is the only place I long to be, Samir. Forever? Forever, Habibi. There's one final place I want to take you before we wake. Okay, where? You'll see. Stand up. Now this journey might be a strange one, but I want you to trust me. Just relax and go with it. Okay. Are you ready? Yes. Samir stood in front of her. He didn't know if this would work. He stepped forward slowly, so he was just an inch from her. Their bodies started overlapping. He was stepping into her. Suddenly, the two were joined as one. Their love and spirits merged. Where are we? 
we're in love. I know, but where are we? We are in love. What? What is it? A place without dimensions. A space outside of time itself that only we can reach. It's where you'll always find me, Ahlan. Here, in love with you. Find you? Where are you going? There aren't many things I'm scared of, Ahlan. But losing you is one of them. Samir? Just as life is a dream when we're together, it's a nightmare when we're apart. Samir, what is this about? I built this for us. A bridge? All I've ever wanted was for us to be together and safe. But all life seems to do is put borders between us. Borders on Earth, between countries. Borders between the dream world and the waking world. And in the end, decades from now, we'll face the ultimate border between life and that which comes after it. The border between life and death. This bridge is beyond borders. It connects dimensions, universes, places, spaces, waking, dreaming, living, dead, and everything in between. This bridge is forever. It won't fade or wither. It will stand here for as long as we're in love. If the world ever pulls us apart, this is where I'll come. This is where you'll find me, Ahlam. Here, on this bridge, in love with you. Then this is where I will meet you, Samir. Here, in love, on this bridge of forever. Take me to a place where you are, way away from my world. Take me through the rain where you are, till then I'll sing to myself. You'll be singing like, oh, oh. How are you, Mr. Solomon? I'm okay. Thank you for asking. How are... Sorry to hear that. No, I said I'm... Okay. Thank you for attending, and I'll see you again in two weeks. That was it? I've been waiting for hours, and the appointment lasts only for one minute? Thank you, Mr. Solomon. 
But I have some questions to ask. I need to know how long it will be until the decision. I need to know what's happening. I've been waiting for months now. My wife, Ahlam. I thought you said she was your fiancé. Yes, my fiancé. She'll die in Sudan. Don't you know about the Janjaweed? Haven't you heard about them on the news? She needs to come here, away from them. It's a process, Mr. Solomon, and you will follow it like everybody else. I have followed it, sir. I just want to know the date for the decision. Please, sir, please tell me. I need to see my fiancé. She needs to be here to be safe with me. She'll die in Sudan. Calm down, Mr. Solomon. When can she come here? I said calm down. When will I see her? To be frank, Mr. Solomon, in your dreams. Now, I would suggest you leave immediately. He wants me to suffer. I see it in his eyes. He hates me, screaming at me with his silence, stabbing me with stillness, doing nothing, torturing me. Why does he hate me? Why does the world hate us? Don't they know how we suffer? How could they not know? How could they not care? What is it about us that they fear so much that they would choose to put us in cages before making us their neighbors? What hatred possesses them that they would watch us bleed on their screens and curse our dead bodies for floating on their shores? When did white become God and brown something to tolerate? Who permits them to decide another's fate? Whether a child should live or die, whether a dream should be allowed to grow or be sneered at and destroyed. The dreams have coordinates. Do they belong only to Europeans? Do I not have the right to dream? And when did safety become something to dream of? When did a future become a dream and not my right? When did life become such a nightmare? Drown and say how sad but man was brown Then it's so normal, sit you down And make you hate him more than now This They'll lock you out and watch you drown And say how sad but man was brown Then it's so normal, sit you down And make you hate him They'll lock you out and watch you drown And tell the world to blame you for drowning Say how sad but the man was brown And don't watch that, it would get you down Then they gun for them, put blood on them Then come around saying that we run from them But but your man mates got love for them And they are for them, that's brother for them What the hell is this? I'm in the air but the world spins I'm in the whirlwind, I never felt this I am in the middle of hell's pits I feel helpless, I can't help this I break out of order, the route of order Bang out of order I can't move cause I've been locked down What now? I think I need to bang out of order Living in a prison, Britain isn't what I wish it was I never get the bringing city Getting paid commission on imprisonment And minute to women it's horrific You don't really wanna listen Are you really gonna hear it on? Is there really God? Can you hear me God? Tell me, what do they fear me God? Tell me, how many years have I got? Please help me Drown and say how sad but man was brown and it's so normal sit you down and make you hate him more than now this They'll lock you out and watch you drown and say how sad but man was brown and it's so normal sit you down and make you hate him Samed was in the officer's dream he had found a path there. It was freezing, empty, and dark there. It was too dark for shadows. He could barely see. He tried to turn the lights up, but this was not his dream. The air there was toxic. It was hard to breathe. It was like a nightmare, like nothing he had seen. Then appeared the officer, now without a suit and tie, but he could barely make him out. The officer was moving by, nervously, desperately yearning for something, determined to find it. He was searching for something. It was a woman. The officer tried to speak with her, but she wouldn't answer. With every question she ignored, the lighting there got darker. He would try to catch her eye, but she would turn her head away. He wanted her to notice him, but he could never get her gaze. Samed could see the man was overcome with deep despair. The woman wouldn't speak to him, as if she couldn't see him there. He told her that he loved her, and you could see he meant it. Suddenly, there were bangs of thunder, and it ended. 
عيوني روحي سامر You sound sad What is wrong? Nothing's wrong, حبيبتي How has your day been? سامر Tell me I had my reporting meeting Yes I know Did something happen? Nothing Literally nothing I waited for two hours and the meeting lasted one minute. I asked him for an update to find out how long it would take for my decision. He wouldn't tell me. I told him that you weren't safe there, that you needed to be here with me. I begged him to tell me when we could be together. You know what he said to me? In your dreams. Habibi. How much longer can we do this? Not knowing, waiting, waiting. It's been months. It's okay, Habibi. We will wait, however long it takes. And in the meantime, we can still dream together. I know, but it's not enough. I don't just want you in my dreams, Ahlam. I want to be with you, here, in this world too. You will. You know we will. Don't lose hope. We've come so far. Where were you last night? I was by the river, but I couldn't see you. Oh, I was in a different dream. Oh, really? Which dream? The officers, the man who I report to. Oh, why? To see whether it's possible for a man without a heart to dream. To see whether he even knows what a dream is. To see what he dreams about. And it worked. What did you find there? He was dreaming of a woman. She was wearing a headscarf. She looked Romanian. He kept trying to speak to her, telling her that he loves her, but she wouldn't respond. Who would have guessed it? What? He's in love and wants to be with her, but he can't. Who does that remind you of? Huh. The heartbroken heartbreaker. I wonder if she is real. I mean, I wonder if she's just in his dream, or whether she exists in real life too, in the waking world. I'm not sure, but if she exists in the waking world, they'll never be together. Why not? Well, because she's Romanian and Brexit. What is Brexit? Believe me, you don't want to know. Gone. In a nutshell. <laughs> The British government decided to give bankers hundreds of billions of pounds after the financial crisis in 2008, crippling the British people through austerity measures. They had 10 years of misery and the country saw a genocide of the poor, but the government managed to redirect their anger away from the powerful people who were consciously killing them and instead towards immigrants and Muslims. This was coupled with the notion that leaving the European Union, aka Brexit, would stop immigrants from entering the country and thus improve living conditions in the UK. The truth, however, is that the effects of Brexit will worsen their real situation, but when the leader of the opposition tried to warn everybody, he was portrayed as a racist and terrorist sympathizer and so the British public voted for an actual racist terrorist and they're all screwed. It's perfect. Brexit. No, Samir. Think about it. He wants to be with her, but he can't. I want to be with you, but I can't. Yeah? What would you do to be with me? Anything. You know that. I'd do anything to be with you. And I bet he would do anything to be with that woman for her to answer him when he speaks to her. Well, yeah. So, what if we taught him how? You want to teach my immigration officer to lucid dream? Yes, we teach him how to lucid dream so he can be with her. But in return, he agrees to use his position at the home office to give us asylum. Alam, you're a genius. It could work. But what would I tell him? Mr. Nobovin, lovely weather we're having, isn't it? Oh, by the way, I've been inside your soul. And I know about the Romanian woman you're in love with. <laughs> yeah, it would be like telling him Jesus was brown. <laughs> he was brown. Exactly. <laughs> it's true. He might not believe you at first. But how else would you know about the woman? Unless you had been in his dream. Yeah, but even if he does believe me, he 
He might be angry that I went into his dream in the first place. What if it backfires? We might ruin our chances altogether. Samir, if he thinks there is even the slightest chance that he could literally be with the woman of his dreams, he will do anything we tell him to. Make a few more journeys into his dreams. Get as much information as you can to prove to him that is true. Then, at your next meeting... When is your next meeting? In 12 days. Then, we have just under two weeks to plan what you are going to say. I love you so much, Habibti. Forever, Habibi. 12 days later. I trust you've calmed down since our last meeting, Mr. Solomon. Sit down. I've got something I need to tell you, Mr. Nobevan. I think after last time you've said enough. I know. Then I'd suggest you stop speaking. I know about the woman you dream of. My patience is running thin, Mr. Solomon. Is this a joke to you? Perhaps you enjoy detention. She wears a headscarf. You search for her in the darkness. You try to speak to her, but she never responds. How? How do you know that? You're in love with her, but it's like she can't see you. How do you know that? There's something I'd like to tell you, Mr. Nobevan. Are you ready to listen now? I know about the woman you're in love with, and it is possible for you to be with her. Who are you? I know you're shocked. I would be too. But just stay calm and I'll explain everything. There's something called lucid dreaming. Have you heard of that before? Lucid dreaming is when you're in a dream and you realize that you're dreaming. You become self-conscious inside the dream. And as a result, you have the power to control everything in the dream, including people. Are you with me so far? Is this black magic? Are you a witch? It's not magic. It's a scientifically proven fact. As humans, we have the ability to wake up inside of our dreams and take control of them. People have been doing this for thousands of years. The difference now is that I have developed a method which means I can use lucid dreaming as a tool to enter into other people's dreams, which is how I know about the woman. What do you want from me? I want to teach you everything I've learned so that you can be with her. Why? Because in exchange, you're going to give me and my wife asylum. I'm going to make it possible for you to be with the woman you love, and you're going to do the same for me. I'm calling security. Then you'll never be with her. You'll dream about her every night for the rest of your life, and you will die without her ever knowing who you are. You have a choice, Mr. Nobevan. We can help each other. We can live our dreams and both be happy. Or you can die alone, knowing that you threw away the only real opportunity you ever had to be with the woman you love. Who is she? The woman. This is none of your bloody business. I'm sorry. I won't ask anything else. It's not my place to. I don't need to know anything about her. We don't need to talk about anything other than how you can be with her. All you need to do is agree to my offer and give me your word that you'll grant us asylum. Even if I wanted to help you, even if I were to agree to your offer, I don't have the power to make that happen. I'm just a staff member. I don't have authority in the Home Office. As far as the UK is concerned, Sudan is a safe country, which means it's almost certain that you'll be sent back there when we make a decision on your case. If the UK decided that Sudan was an unsafe country, then we wouldn't be able to send you back. But the only person who would have the power to declare Sudan as unsafe would be the Home Secretary. Even then, you probably wouldn't be sent back to Sudan. You'd be going to Italy. What do you mean? Why to Italy? You said you were fingerprinted there. Yes, but they let us go. It doesn't matter. 
That was the first country you arrived in and you were fingerprinted there, so that's where you'll be sent. It's called the Dublin Regulation. Anyway, if what you're saying about lucid dreaming is real, and I do believe it is, I wouldn't need you to teach me how to do it. You said people have been doing it for thousands of years, so there must be an instruction manuals. I'll learn by myself. Not so talkative now, are you, Summer? You're right. You'll find articles and videos which can help you learn how to become lucid. Yes. But nobody knows how to share dreams. You won't find a single soul who knows how. I am the only one. You can learn how to become lucid, and you can control the dream so that she speaks to you. But it won't be a shared dream. It won't actually be her. Okay. How about this? You teach me how to share dreams right now, or I'll tell my boss how you threatened to kill me and have you put straight back into detention, lined up for deportation next week. Based on what you've told me, it sounds like I'll be deported in the end anyway. If it's going to happen, I'd prefer that it happens sooner rather than later. Well then, Samir, it looks like you'll be going home to see the ganja weed. And it looks like you'll die alone, Mr. Nobelvin. But I'll give you two weeks to change your mind. You have a choice, and it's a simple one. Find a way to get us asylum, or send me back to Sudan, and say goodbye to the only hope you'll ever have of being with the woman you love. See you in two weeks. Have a good weekend, sir. The officer was still in disbelief at what had happened. Could it be real? Surely it was something he imagined. It couldn't be true. It was like a fiction that you'd read about. But how else could he have seen the woman that he dreams about? It was true. He could learn to lucid dream, but needed help with sharing them. He had to find a way to get asylum for the pair of them. But there was nothing he could do. He was being honest. That was that, he thought. He packed his bag and left the office. What happened next was far beyond what you'd perceive as feasible. A twist of fate. A wind of change, something unbelievable, almost inconceivable. It was like magic. The officer left work and saw a taxi stuck in traffic. Now it was nearly night and so it wasn't really bright, but what he saw, he knew he saw and he was more than quite surprised. It was the home secretary, almost out of sight. He was with a woman, kissing her, but she was not his wife. He was having an affair. The taxi quickly disappeared. The officer was shocked. But then he had a big idea. If he was having an affair, then this could end his whole career. He knew what he was going to do, and soon the plan was clear. He planned to tell the secretary everything he'd seen, that he had evidence to prove it, and the press would get the leak. Unless the home secretary gave them both residency, then he knew Samir would teach him how to share a dream. It was perfect. It couldn't be better. The plan went ahead, and soon Samir received a letter. Dear Mr. Sullivan, I hope this letter finds you well. I'm writing with an update on your asylum application. The Home Secretary, Mr. Bridgeburn, today made a rather sudden and unexpected announcement. Sudan is soon to be reclassified as not safe, and as such, no Sudanese citizens claiming asylum in the United Kingdom will be required to return to Sudan. Further to this, and on revision of existing applications, we duly note that you have been awaiting a decision for a period exceeding six months. In light of this, and after careful consideration, Mr. Bridgeburn has moved to fast-track your application and ultimately concludes that you do indeed meet the criteria required for indefinite leave to remain in the United Kingdom. As such, you have been granted residency and with immediate effect. In response to your previous request, I can confirm that your partner now has the right to residency. And in light of the current political situation in Sudan, which the Home Office recognises as a legitimate threat to her safety, Mr. Bridgeburn has authorised a fast track of her application. Please kindly provide up-to-date contact details for your partner in order for us to process her application. Yours sincerely, David Nobevan, Her Majesty's Home Office. Alam. Alam, we did it. It worked. It worked. We're going to be together in England. 
I'll be able to hold you, to kiss you. We'll be able to live a normal life. We'll be safe. We can start a family. Habibi, we made it. And not just us. The letter said that they're going to reclassify Sudan as not safe. The real truth. So others will stand a better chance of coming here too. Alhamdulillah. You said you would go back and help them. And you have. It was your idea. I can't believe it worked. I wasn't sure it would. Especially after what he said about not having the authority to make it happen. Yeah, I died inside when he said that. How did you think he did it? I've been wondering the same thing. I don't know. I'll ask him. To be honest, right now, I don't care. We're going to be together, Habibti, and soon. <sighs> no more pain. No more begging for a future. No more waiting. No more dreaming. No more dreaming? I only ever dreamt of being with you, Ahlam. Now that's happening. I don't need to dream of what I already have. Really? So you will stop dreaming of me just because you have me? Of course I won't stop. You know what I mean. I'll still dream about you, but we don't have to share dreams anymore. We can be together now, here. I know. I'm just playing. It's true. I would like to share one last dream, though. Just for all time's sake. It doesn't have to be the last time. But yes. Okay, let's do it. Tonight? At the bridge? At the bridge. Ahlam woke up and stepped out of bed. She let out a deep yawn and bent down to stretch. It was the rainy day outside and usually much brighter. She went to turn the light on, but... It didn't light up. She realised she was dreaming. She was lucid and aware. She jumped out a window and flew... She thought that she was dreaming, but she fell when she went out to jump. It wasn't a dream. The light stayed off because there was a power cut. Will you get the urge to call them up but never press the number? When you miss the voice so much, the silence deafens thunder. When every minor memory just cuts you up with comfort. From back when you were younger, now you're both asunder. And hope became a house, and hope moved underground. The tears will thunder down, and when you breathe, you wonder how. And hope abandons you, the world itself is foreign land. Now you sit in darkness, the sun itself could not withstand. Where it's always winter, glitter blows in empty rooms. When it seems life itself might as well end for good when it should. When you feel the life in you, and you can feel them guiding you, but you've forgotten how to live. Even though they like you too But you lost your lover and your friend And you got everyone but them And don't need anyone but them I'll be there when I can I'll come I'll meet you at the place we said I'll see you by the bridge my love I'll find you in the face of death The full moon Isn't without
and every fear has come to be And you can hear them whisper words and there's a pain that cuts you deep Death has come to hold the hand, I wish that it would come for me Cause I would die today to find a way if it was up to me Now it's up to me, my love I'll try my best I'll come for you, I'll search until my final breath Until my time of death, I swear my darling don't be scared Wait for me, patiently, by the bridge, I'll be there As the distance dawns, as I begin to mourn I know you're here with me, the love is just in different form Only bodies say goodbye, not the love, the body's cage Our love remains in time and out of it, beyond this space Death is the cost of life and grief, it seems the cost of love But love does not get lost in time and time is not too long for us How can life be after death when death itself is life and you? And how can you be gone from here when I remain and I am you? The full moon isn't without you The full moon isn't without you in its light I saw you in a dream last told Samir she died. He grabbed his chest. It hurt to breathe. He died inside. He cried and cried. The heavens must have heard his screams. He went to sleep so he could reach the bridge beyond this darkness. The bridge where they agreed to meet if they were ever parted. He got there. She wasn't there. This was it. The dream was dead. He prepared to drown himself so he could be with her in death. He jumped into the river. But just before he fully drowned, a hand reached inside and grabbed his arm and quickly pulled him out. Samir! Ahlam, 